You are listening to Beyond the Verse, a Star Citizen podcast. A show dedicated to Cloud Imperium Games, Star Citizen, and Squadron 42. Whether you fight, explore, unite, and or trade, we bring you news, updates, interviews, reviews, and analysis. So sit back, relax, grab yourself a pour of Radagast, and join us as we go Beyond the Verse. Launch sequence activated. Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Beyond the Verse, Star Citizen podcast with your host, Solus. And we are in episode 14 uh, that we are calling the Declaration of War. Yeah, we are finally getting into the Squadron 42 Lore Deep Dive. This will be part one of a multi-part series. So stay tuned to the end of this podcast or towards the end of the podcast. And we're going to start getting into the Vandal War, the declaration of the war itself, and where we go from here. There's a lot to talk about today. Uh, a lot of like in-game personal experiences, not necessarily groundbreaking news, which I feel like that's a first in the last several weeks. But quickly, um, since last Friday, we have a CitizenCon drop with the prices also released. So that'll be something we want to react to. <laughs> um, have a cool story about Saturday, kind of on the personal side, but it's about gaming and development and just who you don't know who you're talking to. Um, might be somebody important. Sunday, we had Bar Citizen in Austin, Texas. I want to respond to that. Had a great time meeting very awesome, interesting people. We'll go through Monday, This Week in Star Citizen. We'll address very quickly the Tuesday New Alien, uh, new alien Language post. Nothing really happened on Wednesday. And then today was a pretty busy day. Uh, today was the launch of Jump Town 2.1. Um, there's a quick announcement about a couple of the ships uh, where the cost is increasing at the end of the month. Not for Jump Town, but after this event, those those ships will go up in price. Um, and then we'll end with the Inside Star Citizen featurette that happened today um, with the mission features team going into 320. So some really good information there. And again, like I said, we will wrap up with the lore deep dive that we haven't done in several weeks now, uh, but we'll wrap up with the lore deep dive um, going into a breaking news of the incursion that happened above Vega 2 from a firsthand account that happened of the invasion. We're actually going to watch Admiral Bishop's speech to the Senate, and then we will end uh, with a potential cliffhanger on um, what we should think of Admiral Bishop. So let's actually get into some of this fun conversation. Let's get into Citizen Kind. Um, so it's funny, funny story. <clears throat> I am working. <laughs> uh, I am working at my desk. Uh, I'm head down in a monthly review that we have to send out. Um, and my brother texts me and I'm like, I'll, ch I'll check that text in a couple of minutes, followed by an immediate phone call. I'm like, oh my gosh, is something, something happening? This is my brother and he doesn't normally like call right after a text. Um, come to find out, he he got intel that CitizenCon dropped the information about it, um, the kind of who, what, when, where's, and why's. Um, and so we already had plane tickets, but we still needed to get hotels. So we were like, oh, crap, let's get in. Let's get the closest hotel um, that we could at the time. So, you know, mission success. We were able to get a room. Um, but the biggest question now was like the tickets. So... Real quick, um, I would be doing my due diligence for this podcast if I didn't, shocker, share my screen for those of you on YouTube uh, and show y'all this, um, basically what is CitizenCon and what to expect for this year. So we're not going to spend a lot of time going through this, but CitizenCon is their convention. It's their version of BlizzCon or Comic-Con. Uh, 2953, of course, is the year that we are currently in in Star Citizen. So this is their culmination event that they haven't had in person for several years. So it's important. It's it's 
crucial, right? Um, a lot of speculation on what's going to be announced or what we should talk about going into CitizenCon because it is the first time that we've been in person. So if you're watching my screen share on YouTube, you're seeing the, um, the animation that anybody can go see. It's robertspaceindustries.com forward slash CitizenCon. Um, but 120 days out, 120 days out, uh, quote real quick. After four long years, it's back. CitizenCon returns live and in person, touching down at the Los Angeles Convention Center October 21st and 22nd. Break. So this was uh, also a surprise because we originally were told it was one day and now it's a two-day event. It doesn't really change anything. If you already had flights, you just simply move your returning flight out. Um, and I did that and actually saved money. It was actually cheaper to fly out on a Monday or fly back on a Monday than it was on a Sunday. So I'll take it back to the article. This epic two day event is more than just a convention. It's a pan galactic celebration of the vibrant community that breathes life into the star citizen universe, a place where we can come together and share the remarkable things we've achieved together while looking forward to a future brimming with even more amazing adventures. Buckle up pilot. You're about to embark on an unforgettable journey beyond imagination. The countdown to CitizenCon starts now. So that little paragraph isn't much new. Um, if you've already been privy to this website, other than the dates change, right? <clears throat> the important piece is down here with the tickets, <laughs> right? Sparked a lot of controversy. Uh, and we'll get into a little bit of that conversation um, after I read this article quickly. Tickets. Mark your calendars. This year's tickets will be available in two tiers and in limited quantities. Here's a breakdown of what to expect. CitizenCon 2953 access ticket. Your ticket to both days of CitizenCon also gets you exclusive swag, both physical and digital. CitizenCon 2953 premium experience ticket. This extremely limited upgrade adds VIP perks to your CitizenCon ticket with access to an exclusive after party on Sunday night and more. Break. That sounds fun. Uh, I would be interested to see who they bring there. Usually after parties include celebrities. At least the Twitch cons that I've been a part of and other conventions that I have been a part of, usually an after party includes individuals. So that might be very interesting to find more information about. Back to the article. Both tickets are available in limited quantities, so don't wait too long to get your hands on these coveted tickets. Starting on June 28th, that's next Wednesday. Early access will open exclusively for concierge and subscribers. The following day, June 29th, general sales open to the public. So June 28th, you see the early access wave schedule in the three waves. You can see it on the screen. Uh, and then June 29th, general sale wave schedule, wave one, two, and three. Basically, it's it says 1,600 UTC, 0, 0,100 UTC, and 0, 0,800 UTC. If you're in Central, just minus five, right? So 1,600 UTC is 1,100 UTC, or 1,100 Central. All right, so there you go. I just educated you on this podcast. <laughs> um, here is the controversy. Um, now, I don't necessarily buy into the controversy, but it's my due diligence to tell you what everybody's talking about. So there's, um, first off, the concierge and subscriber dynamic. There are some concierge members that are upset that subscribers also get the early access perk and the concierge members don't get the additional couple of days. Now, I'm a Praetorian concierge member. You can Google what the hell that means. Um, but there's a reason why I'm saying that. Um, I, I don't care. I don't care. Subscribers spend $10 a month to be a subscriber and I have spent several dollars on, on being a concierge member. Um, do I deserve to get tickets before somebody else? I don't know if I care enough really to, to have an opinion on that. Um, I will be doing the F5 war um, the same time everybody else will. And I am sure I will be fine. I'm sure at the very least I will get a general access ticket. I'm not, uh, I'm not really upset about it, but there is conversation going on socials as maybe concierge should have two days early access, whereas subscribers only have the one day early access. Don't care, but that is the conversation that's happening. 
The other controversy that is happening, again, if you're looking at my screen, uh, I'm gonna switch quickly over uh, to the announcement in Spectrum where uh, our favorite Zylo, head of community, uh, did make a, a comment on June 17th. What is that, five days ago? Yep, June 17th, where he states the price of the tickets. So I tweeted about this on socials. A lot of people did, just basically reporting the cost. I even ran a poll on which ticket you're going to be purchasing. Um, but the two prices for the general access it is $200, and for the premium access, the VIP treatment after party, that's $300. So, so yeah, I mean, steep. It is, it's, it's very expensive. And again, I've ran a few Twitch cons, having worked with Amazon and, and been part of that effort. I've been a, a, a part of a lot of Twitch cons and different conventions. It is, it is very expensive, but, but, um, it's, it's not like, I mean, I'm going to kind of insult people, I think when I say this, uh, but it's not like blizzard that is running like BlizzCon or the comic con in San Diego, where they're going to have millions of people come and thousands of people just flood auditoriums. Um, it, it's not, it's not that experience. So I, I think when you talk about the VIP extras and the after parties and what they're trying to provide to the patrons that are going to be there, um, I don't know. I hope it's worth it. I, I really do. And I'm going to go find out. So uh, again, my brother and I, a few of the other individuals from the org are going to go and we're going to experience citizen kind. Uh, we'll let you know, <laughs> uh, but you can also watch from your home for free. And there's going to be a virtual stream of it and feel free to feel free to do that as well. So those are your two controversies that come with Citizen Con. Um, just quickly more, I'm gonna go back to screen sharing, more about Citizen Con. You can sign up for community booths. There's a whole process for that. Uh, it's an email process. I actually I actually submitted one for my org. Um, but <clears throat> It's, it's an email process. You answer a couple questions, really no different than you would any other convention you send it off. There's a cosplay contest and they're also asking for volunteers. So if you are going, let's say you're going by yourself and you're like, man, it's gonna be, it's gonna be lame to go by myself with no friends. What better opportunity than to go as a volunteer, meet friends, right, by working at uh, the convention, right? So citizen con happened. <laughs> Uh, I, I, there's a lot, there's a lot to, uh, talk about and I'm going to leave it there. I've covered all the topics as deep as I want to cover them, uh, for this podcast. But if you're interested more, just sign into Twitter and I'm sure, especially Wednesday, this next week when they go live and the tickets go live to purchase, you're going to hear it all again. Right? So feel free to jump on in. <laughs> so that was Friday. On Saturday, I have a really cool story. Uh, my son had a birthday party, very local, like here in the neighborhood. First off, Austin, Texas, it was like 108 degrees outside. And of course, this party was outside in a backyard. <laughs> so uh, it was a hot experience. Um, but what's interesting, and, and, and I love this, um, I, I took, you can see on YouTube and you can see on my socials, my wife for Father's Day, which happy belated Father's Day to those listening. My wife got me this very awesome Yeti tumbler and it's got the Beyond the Verse logo on the outside. Again, you can see it on stream, um, you can see it in socials, but I brought that with me um, to, uh, to this party. And so I have it, I'm drinking water quote unquote, because <laughs> it's because it's so hot outside. Um, and one of the other fathers sees it and just simply asks what that what that logo was. And I gave an elevator pitch, right? I didn't go into a whole podcast of, of what I do, but I gave a very quick elevator pitch. Hey, I'm a content creator. I do a podcast for a video game called Star Citizen. I ended it there. But there were three fathers that overheard and they were like, oh, hey, you're a gamer too. And so for the next hour, as my kid is being a seven-year-old and playing in water outside in 108 degree weather, <laughs> the three fathers um, stood off to the side and we talked about Diablo 4. We talked about Elite Dangerous. We talked about um, the other games that they, were, that they were playing. One of them actually worked on video games. So we had like a developer conversation. 
Well, I was able to get them into the organization or the Discord, uh, and who knows, we might have two more individuals joining the Star Citizen community, but um, it was just a really awesome, really awesome moment to be able to talk about Star Citizen and realize um, it is fun to talk about. Now, at the same time, I have a, this is my own personal obstacle, my own personal problem, uh, is I know how 318 went. I know how 319 went uh, during Invictus Launch Week and not being able to call ships. I love talking about Star Citizen. I am more hesitant on saying like, now is the time. Like, stop playing Diablo 4, jump into Star Citizen because I just don't have a lot of faith in this current moment. Now, not dogging CIG, not to open up that can of worms. I, I, I support and understand where they're at and why we're at where we're at. But uh, it's hard to recruit friends <laughs> into, into a game. So I'm like, hey, check out the podcast. Maybe they're watching. Maybe they're listening tonight. Um, check out the podcast. If it's something that you want to uh, ask more questions about, feel free to reach out. Uh, but again, just a really cool awesome story let's get into sunday so first contact alien week um we had the bar citizens across the entire united states and again i'm blessed to be in austin texas um through this endeavor and uh i was able to go to to this to this location of course it's outdoors and it's 109 degrees so galactica thank you so much jake acapella thank you so much uh for giving me a reason to drink whiskey which the only way to drink whiskey is neat, uh, to drink whiskey out in 109 degree weather. So awesome, that was a great experience. But the people and the event was so much fun. Um, I was able to meet, um, and I'm gonna probably butcher names, but I, I believe the gentleman's name was Giona. Uh, I met Crow, and then I met Paul, the Astro Historian in person. Like, how cool is that? I had used him as a, or we used each other as co-hosts in a couple episodes ago. Uh, and actually met him in person. Uh, Crow is a uh, partner for Elite Dangerous. And we had a really awesome conversation about Elite Dangerous versus, and I say that in quotes because it's not one versus the other, but Elite Dangerous now it compares to Star Citizen. Giona is like a former content creator. Uh, he's taken a break or is retired from it, but just a really, really awesome conversation between a lot of us content creators just a really good a really good experience but again being able to sit down with jake and being able to sit down with galactica uh, having met them earlier last year in san antonio it was a lot of fun we did get issued cards for the banu tholo so last episode i surmised that you had to go to a bar citizen to get the uh, the banu tholo and sure enough as you can see, let me see, I have to switch over to my camera to make sure it works. You can see this card that I'm now showing up on uh, on YouTube. You get one of these, it has you know a code on the back that you can put into the uh, pledge store. But yeah, it is basically an eight ball fidget spinner, legit. And if you're interested to see what it is and what it looks like in game, go on over to my TikTok or my Twitch or Instagram, uh, Beyond the Verse or Star Citizen BTV, and you can watch a video that I created that shows it, but it literally is a fidget spinner. And once it's done spinning, it tells you your fortune or the answer to your question. It's cool. It's like the Banu replica box um, that was kind of around last year. It's FPS item, hangs around your hanger, but it, it's just something to have that a lot of people won't have. So very cool. Had a great time in Bar Citizen. I will say funny story, funny story. I was amped up, I was ready to go. The first question was who can name the alien races? And I'm like, I got this, I run a podcast. We talk lore all the time. So I raised my hand and my dumbass said, you know, Banu, Vandal, Tavarin, Xion. That's good, right? It's the four now. Now there's six. <laughs> there's six and had i uh watched all of friday's narrative um interview i would have been reminded of the hadatians and of the karthik i would have been reminded of those two and completely screwed that one up so i missed my chance to get a physical edition of jump town volume three so that sucks but you know who did get a physical copy of Jump Town Volume 3, Paul, 
from the Astro Historian. So you win again. <laughs> uh, you win again. Let's move on. Let's actually get into this week in Star Citizen sharing screen. All right, so uh, here we go. So more of the cartoonish bright colors representing Alien Week. I, I, I will say this one last time. I, when, when I hear aliens, I think Vandal staking a, a spear through a human's face. I, I don't I don't see I don't see rainbow colors, but hey, it is what it is. Let's keep going. Uh, all right, last week we released a big info drop on Citizen Con 2953. Blah blah blah. We just covered all that. Fantastic. Last week we also saw the release of Star Citizen Alpha 3.19.1, which uh, which, which, which was supposed to fix a variety of, of issues. Uh, quote, however, the team is aware and monitoring a number of ongoing known issues, such as, here we go, ASAP terminals not consistently functioning. Like this, like the, this goes back to what I was saying about like, let's talk about Star Citizen to raise awareness and get people interested, but I'm still like, oh, I need a solid state before I really start bringing in my friends. ASAP terminals still suck. All right, back to the article. One of the big highlights of last week was the kickoff of this year's Alien Week. Yep, there's a new commercial. We talked about it. International Bar Citizen Weekend. We talked about it. First contact day, talked about it. Let's see what's going on this week. Alien Week continues. Um, this Tuesday, they published an alien language post, which I normally try to do, but I have not had time work has been killing me all right thursday welcomes another round of jump town 2.1 for those looking to clash in addition we'll welcome a new episode of inside star citizen focusing on the mission feature teams exciting work for alpha uh, alpha 320 and beyond on friday this is tomorrow if you're listening to this podcast on friday star citizen live returns with a game dev episode about production with lead producer jake ross and you'll also find our weekly rsi newsletter directly delivered to your inbox in addition the bar citizen world tour continues with a few notable upcoming events members of the team are currently traveling to shanghai which i think i saw socials from tyler i want to say he's been he's been at Shanghai, but all right, for the largest community organized event to date, over 1,500 attendees, followed by a bar citizen stop in Hong Kong and South Korea, and many more to come throughout the remainder of the year. Plus, the uh, Show Us Your Color Celebration 2023 continues, so if you're going to participate in that, go for it. Uh, have a stellar week in the rest of the verse. So I, I would call this a fairly light week, which which makes sense. We're still in the middle of... Uh, Alien Week. Well, actually, as of today, it's it's ending. Uh, this is the end of Alien Week as of today. No, it's not. I'm looking at the schedule, and it looks like it's still going on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Interesting. I actually don't know when it ends. So, hold on. Let me just... I'm doing this live. So, a week is defined by seven days. It went live last Thursday. So, by definition, it should be done today. So, I don't know. I don't know what's happening anymore. <laughs> I quit. All right, let's go to Tuesday. All right, so Tuesday, um, we had the language uh, uh, transmission from the Banu uh, that came across. You can go in the comms link and find it and translate it yourself. Um, I normally, again, I normally try to do it, but Amazon's been kicking my ass uh, in the last couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, we're looking into Q2, Q3 progression, etc. This is not a podcast about work, but um, I have not been able to do it. So let's go into screen share. We're not doing this live. Just I'm going to show you what it looks like. So here we go. Begin transmission. And there's a bunch of Banu on here. Now, if you follow our socials, I think I only did it on Twitter. But I linked some of the Star Citizen tools at StarCitizen.tools website. Um, I linked some of their translation pages. You should be able to go in and do it pretty quickly. Um, normally, you can come down here to the feedback and somebody has already deciphered it. However, nothing is consistent. There's a couple of guesses and there's a couple of jokes. Um, I would not trust anything in the feedback section. <laughs> So again, I, it, it, it is fun. First off, let me, let me break and say this. Any game that pursues its own language um, has the intent and vision to make their game deep, 
right? It, robust. Like you don't pursue a Xi'an language, a Banu language. I'm sure there's going to be Von Duel and there's going to be other languages uncovered um, as we get closer to launch. But you don't you don't create an entire language and dictionaries and references if you don't intend to create this robust historic lore deep video game. So I'm excited there. More more to come, I am sure. Ah, okay. I wanted like another break between that and Jump Town. So here we go. <laughs> this morning. This morning they released uh, Jump Town, or they, they turned on Jump Town 2.1. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you can see some pretty images uh, going on behind me. Um, so, okay. So a lot of the community is, is like feigning anger. Uh, because there hasn't been a stable state since 318 or before 318. And so there's 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 Xeno threats. There's Evictus Launch Week, straight into that Jump Town 2.1, straight into Alien Week. And now we've got for this weekend, we've got Jump Town 2.1 yet again. I'll say it again. Jump Town is not a game breaking instance it, it, it's uh, if you avoid if you avoid jump town and you don't participate in it i have never had an issue <laughs> knock on wood now it's gonna now it's gonna jack with me but i've never had an issue with jump town outside of actually going to jump town so already on socials you're reading and you're hearing um desync and visible characters and visible ships people are getting shot out of nowhere um if that's your experience, as sad as it is, um, I would just try Jump Town at a different at a different point in the game. Um, I personally will probably try Jump Town tonight, but the first time I have a negative experience, I'm popping out and I'm going to do some delivery missions, right? Or retrieve op missions. Or my my latest, like you heard in the last episode, my latest thing is uh, is the Merc missions. Kind of a peaceful run into a bunker, murder everybody, and you're good to go. Right, so nothing new has changed since uh, three episodes ago. I mean, it hasn't been that long since Jump Town was already live. So maybe three episodes. I'm not going to read this. Uh, it's how to get into Jump Town, what to do when you're there. There's a lawful side and unlawful side to it. We're not going to rehash all of that. But I will go through the Jump Town schedule. So here are the dates. It's shorter then after Invictus launch week. So that should be good news to some of you. But the Jumptown schedule for 319.1, here we go, June 22nd through June 25th. You're singing on my screen, uh, but these are 9 a.m. Pacific, so 11 a.m. Central. Um, again, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th, and, that, and those are the dates and times that the location will change. So if I were to guess my assumption was would be it'd be a jump town at a different system a day. So let's say it starts today in Crusader. So maybe tomorrow it'll move and jump town will be in Arcorp or Lorville or Hurston, right? So there you go. That's really it. Um, we get into special vehicles that are available. This is this is nice, right? So if you missed your chance to get some of these vehicles, maybe during the Victus launch week, you have 13 vehicles to choose from to pick up from the pledge store. Now, I, I this brings up another conversation, but let's just go quickly through the 13. So we got the Ballista, the C2, the Andromeda, which is a phenomenal constellation. Yeah, the Cuddy Black, which I actually would have preferred the Cutlass Red. That's kind of a better drop ship. That's a better ship, in my opinion, to, to roll into Jump Town. The Gladius, the Mercury, or MSR, the Nova, which I had originally said, let me correct the, on the record, a couple episodes ago, I th thought this was still in concept. It's clearly drivable, right? Flight ready. It's clearly in game and you can fly it or drive it so there we go nova the prowler which that was going to be available anyways because it's alien week the redeemer a solid multi-crew gunship that is one of my favorite multi-crew gunships it's a lot of firepower the ursa the valkyrie which 
my opinion, it's the best dropship. That's that's going to be your best dropship. Most HP, most firepower, go for it. Uh, the Hoplite, which is is like the worst dropship. <laughs> um, I'll go into my whys later. I, I don't think, uh, I don't want this podcast to really ever be about min-maxing. I don't want it to ever be about meta. That there's There are better content creators that do that. The Hoplite's a joke in my opinion. All right, so the Warden, pretty good. And then back to the Ballista. So what I wanted to show you, and I'm still screen sharing, what I wanted to show you was there was an announcement uh, earlier in the year that said that three ships were going to increase in cost, right? So the Avenger Titan, the Cutlass Black, and the Vanguard, the Vanguard Hoplite. Um, many have asked, I'm going to the article, quote, many have asked if we plan to make the ships available for, at, for a last chance before the price is updated, and we would like to confirm that we will as part of the Jumptown 2.1 event this week. So this is the last time to get the Titan, the Cutlass Black, and the Hoplite at the original prices, okay? After then, the Titan increases by $5, the Cutty Black increases by $10, and the Hoplite increases by $5. So consider yourself warned. Uh, <laughs> I they're, they're only increasing by a couple of dollars. At, at, at the grand scheme of things, um, you're already spending a lot of money as it is. So if a Cutlass Black increases by $10, I don't know. Now the debate, right? The controversy now is why? Why is it increasing? You know, you could say inflation. You could say because the intention was always for the prices of ships, you know, to increase. But I think this is where the investment conversation comes in. If you are an investor in the game, you're a concierge member, you're going to be spending more money, et cetera. It's better to pledge for a ship at the earliest moment Usually get LTI, lifetime insurance, usually get some other perks, but pledge for a ship as early as you can because this happens, right? Like I think the Banu Merchant Man was in the 300s when it first came out for you to pre-order or for you to pledge. It was like in the 300s. Now it's like 650, right? So just a good rule of thumb if you're crazy enough to get into that whole <laughs> CCU game, which again, this podcast will not get into. <laughs> um Okay, I have said my piece about Jumptown. Uh, we talked about the cost of ships going up. Let's talk about Inside Star Citizen and the uh, Mission Features Team 3.20. So I, I have mixed emotions. I really want to just show you the 16 minutes. Um, I'll at least show you some of it. You can go onto YouTube and watch it yourself, obviously. But the, uh, the whole 16 and a half minute video is absolutely amazing. It's all relative. All of it is relative. It's different. It's the consignment mission that we were all curious about. It was changes to the law system, so ship trespass. So if you had questions about what's coming out in patch 320, this 16 and a half minute video answered most of my questions. So I did this really cool thing. Uh, I went ahead and stamped. I'm gonna go and share my screen, why not? I went ahead and uh, stamped, and I do this to most of their videos, but I stamped the timestamps, right? So if you if you go in and watch this video, I did the work for you. So if you're interested in the salvage missions, uh, the additional platforms created in Orison uh, for scalability, the new consignment missions, the updates to the law system, the heist missions. So in the future, there's gonna be barge missions, which is like another version of Jump Town. That's gonna be super awesome and then outro and outtakes. So I personally think the uh, the new consignment missions is kind of what I wanna show you. This is four minutes. Feel free to skip ahead if you're listening to the replay or to the podcast, but we're gonna listen to about a four minute video on the new consignment missions. So let me share my screen. Let's go. The new consignment mission involves the item dispensers that you've seen at Jump Town and in Korea. The consignment missions are made by Max. You'll be tasked with going to the UGF to retrieve a mission critical item. There are several NPCs walking around, either security guards or other NPCs, and several of them will be carrying data pads with a code on them. By taking the tablets on them, players can see these codes. You will have to shift through 
multiple codes to find that item. Think of it as a, an Amazon locker where you have a code for your delivery. So you have to look on the tablet which code hold which set of items. Uh, you go to a terminal, enter the code, and then it starts spitting out these objects one by one. You can even type back code in and like stop it halfway through and then type the code in again and get the, the other half of the consignment out. The consignments can be found in various places. Like there's a lawful mission where you go and the security occupants of a UGF have been uh, killed by the Ninetales. So there's all these corpses around and you have to go searching through them while fighting off the Ninetales to find these data pads and, you know, scanning through the data pad and you find in whether it's got um, the mission critical items that you're looking for or maybe just some really valuable items for things like Had and Nye and uh, Dolovy and things like that that you usually only find in um, like one-handed carryables we're adding into boxes. So that's a nice little uh, like bonus there you'll be able to find. The greedier you are or the longer you take um, to get this mission done, the mission get grows more and more difficult. We built a new, uh, a new system, a new module, which we're calling the Anti-Up system. It allows us to spawn increasingly difficult waves of AI that will approach and attack the player while they're at a location. The AI coming out of it grow more difficult, like through light, heavy, um, medium armors. The unlawful version of this, you are, you're actually acting as the Ninetales, say. So you go into a, a UGF that's run by securities and you have to um, kill the bosses that come out and get the data pad off of those. I do a lot of bunker missions, so I'm, uh, I'm excited to get some more variety in them. Unfortunately, like, I play more on the lawful side of things, so if it's like a bunker mission where I have to kill like security guards, I'll be less inclined to do it. But um, if it's shoot nine tails and steal their stuff, then yeah, I'm all for it. So the reputation ladder is going to be tied to uh, these missions. A lot of players care about the reputation ladder themselves in completing that process, but as an extra incentive to climb it, they will unlock the harder tiers of this mission. And in the process of doing so, there will be more data pads that can drop across the mission. It will be more difficult to stay at the location the more data pads you want to retrieve and you can sift your way through the mission critical items and the extra items of the things you want, load them up, get them out of the UGF onto your ship and away. So it's going to be all about how much players want to go for the extra bonus loot, whether it's worth the risk of staying if they are low on ammo or are being overwhelmed or if they have enough friends to bring to them to the location, which versions of the mission that they do. So I think it's going to be really interesting and it gives players the opportunity to do missions at their own pace and, you know, remain at the location as long as possible uh, as the risk increases. So there you go. I, I love it. Um, I absolutely love the idea. I, I, like I said, mercenary missions are my thing. Um, I love going to the bunkers. We talked about it kind of in the last episode where I like the idea of dropping a click away and driving a ship in and kind of role playing in that sense. And this unlocks another version. And it's, it's fun to see the different ways that they're thinking about making those missions intricate. Right. What else can they do? There's data pads, right? Like you're going to loot a body. You're going to search a body and find a data pad. And that might be your Amazon code and it might not be. First off, I absolutely love that they mentioned the Amazon locker box. Uh, you're talking to one of the regional managers that invented that. So <laughs> anyways, I digress. <laughs> so um, it, it's just really cool. And there's more to that video that I think is applicable. There's the barge mission I think is amazing. It's this idea that you're going to go into, I'm going to call it a warehouse, and you're going to see all these different branded uh, connexes or, you know, the 18 wheeler boxes, trailers, and you're going to search those for loot and a, a Kovalex box is going to have something different from, you know, Red Hall or Red, uh, I forgot which brand that was, but all the different versions or uh, merchants or vendors. So I think there's, there's some really exciting, uh, realistic updates coming to some of what we're doing so there we go so watch inside star citizen mission features uh it is a phenomenal phenomenal 16 and a half minutes i think i've repeated myself enough for this podcast so all right without 
further ado, we are 20 minutes left in the podcast, enough time for us to cover the entry into Squadron 42. So let's go ahead and play our little sound bite, uh, and we will get into our lore deep dive for today. When last we left off, we read an article that was dated in 2934, entitled A Dreamer Dreams. This was one of the last articles we read in that episode a few a few episodes ago. But I'm going to reread it because I think it sets the stage about 300 years ago when the Battle of the uh, Centauri occurred. We, we got our first true glimpse of Squadron 42. They feigned uh, retreat and Squadron 42 came out of uh, a flanked position and took out the enemy. And so they created this amazing following and this reputation of being a bunch of um, kind of rule breakers. They do their own thing. Uh, a lot, you might want to call them like the special forces. And I say that being an operator from the SF. Um, they, they kind of abide by their own jurisdiction, right? Their own legal system. And so for 300 years, they develop, like I said, this reputation into 2934, where it gets talked about in a very awesome narrative. And this is why I wanted to revisit, to set the stage for getting into Squadron 42. So let's go back to it. 2934, A Dreamer Dreams. This is an ebook report from a fifth grader entitled Burning Sky, a Squadron 42 Adventure. This break I read Burning Sky. It was really good. It was all about Squadron 42, who are awesome. It takes place in 2910 when a bunch of Vandal warships attack their carrier. The main character was Lieutenant Terence Nolan. He was from a small town in Elysium system, sort of like the one my cousin lives in. He joined the fleet instead of going to school because he wanted to see the stars. There was a good scene where he was out in the fields looking up at the sky and wondering what was out there. He wanted to see what the nobodies, he wanted to see what nobody's ever seen. That was a cool idea. Like, are there whole groups of aliens that we haven't met? I never thought of that. See, when I'm a pilot, I just want to see a nebula, a big one. I think that would be max. After flight school, Lieutenant Terence Nolan went to the eastern sectors. He was part of a patrol wing along the Xi'an border. He was pretty bored because nothing really happened. Then one shift, he saw a small transport ship getting chased by pirates. Even though there were like four pirates and Lieutenant Nolan was alone, he attacked. It was crazy, and his ship was getting all shot up. But he got like three of the pirates before the other pilots showed up. And he saved the transport. After that, he got congratulated, then lectured, by his commander. He was mad because it was stupid for him to take on four pirates on his own. That was how he got drafted into Squadron 42. They liked that kind of stupid. Lieutenant Nolan gets transferred back to the Western Systems. Now he's part of the squadron. While the rest of the fleet runs from the Vanduul, they go looking for a fight. They're like the only thing standing between our system and a bunch of raiders. Their commander is this smart, tough lady named Aria Riley. She's been like fighting her whole life ever since her town was burned down by raiders. Their carrier was heading past the settlement systems into unclaimed space. They were hunting. After like two weeks on the carrier, it seemed like no one liked Lieutenant Nolan. They all thought he was a wimp, but then the next morning their ship got ambushed by a bunch of Vandal scythes, like a hundred of them. Lieutenant Nolan and the other pilots jumped in their ships and blasted off to fight them. The battle lasted six hours. 
The fighters twisted through space trying to blow each other up while the carrier battled a Vandal destroyer that was lying in wait. It looked like they were going to lose, but then Lieutenant Nolan took command of the pilots that were still alive and fought back even harder. They didn't give up no matter what. Reading this book was really fun. It was a little boring before the battles, but I'm glad I stuck with it. My dad says that he remembered when this happened back when he was a kid. He loves the 42nd Squadron, too. He says he's got a bunch of other to transmit to me. I hope that I am just like Lieutenant Nolan when I become a pilot. I think everybody should read this. That's my report. I personally see this as, as kind of the American version of like the Rangers. It's everybody knows who the Rangers are, right? You see the tab if you're Ranger qualified. You see the scroll if you're part of one of the regiments, right? But you always you grow up. You want to be an airborne Ranger. That's what everybody wants. I feel like in this moment, the human race sees Squadron Forty Two as as this tip of the spear, right? They're going to be the front line of defense and offense in this battle. So that's what I get from this book report from a fifth grader. If a fifth grader knows about a fighting regiment, it's probably something pretty, pretty massive. So let's get into new material. So that was 2934. Let's go to the year 2945. This article is called Empire Report, the Vandal Attack. Sharing my screen. Breaking news. We interrupt your spectrum programming for urgent breaking news. We have just learned of a major Vandal raid in the Vegas system. Details are still coming in. But we've received early comms indicating that the Navy border fleet is currently engaged with a massive Vandal force outside of Aramis's orbit. No firm word yet on what could be the heavy military and civilian losses. To repeat, there has been a large-scale Vandal incursion into the Vega system directly above Vega 2. Not much is known at the moment. We have been trying to establish contact with our local affiliate, but have had no success so far. We suspect that the array grid has been severely damaged in the fight. We have just gotten word that Imperial officials at the NFSC are requesting that everyone hold off on trying to contact friends and loved ones in Vega at the moment, in order to keep comm relays free for emergency communication. This may hamper the flow of information out of the system beyond official channels, but we will keep working to learn as much as we can. Our thoughts and hopes go out to all those in Vega and the brave starmen fighting there. Stay tuned for more details as they arrive. This has been Beck Russum with the Empire Report. And this was the beginning of October. I believe the dates, if you do the math with some other articles, it's like October 5th of 2945. Kind of a scary moment. If you're in a role playing and you're you're you believe in kind of putting yourself in the shoes of the player, um, I can see Squadron Forty Two, the video game, opening up in in something like this. You either you either see the Vandal raid that happened in October, or maybe you're the character and you're watching this flash across your screen, kind of like The Last of Us right like the the video game last of us whenever you first launch the game and you see the news i can kind of see it starting out that way but yeah that's that's got to be gut wrenching to have a threat i mean we we read about this we've we've heard about this on this podcast for 300 plus years there has been risk involved with all four of those alien races and to finally hear that something went down in the Vegas system, that's got to be gut-wrenching for the human race. Let's get into our third article of the night. The next day, so this is October 6th, 2945, article's called Aramis Post, New Corvo in Ruins. 
sharing my screen. New Corvo and Ruins. A music festival was just getting started in Beecher Park. The air was surprisingly cool despite being well into the summer months. Workers in New Corvo were heading back to work after lunch. I had dropped my family off at Carrying Station. It was my father-in-law's birthday in Astilia, and they were heading up early to surprise him. I was supposed to follow later in the day. Walking back to the Aramis post offices along bustling streets, a dull noise cut through the din of the city. All around me, Moby Glass began to flash with an emergency warning. I hadn't seen one of these in a while. It was a basic non-flight advisory and said details were pending. I had started to move on when this old civil defense sirens began. Their sound echoed off the tall buildings along Malcaroy Street. Instinctively, my head turned toward the sky. Next thing I knew, I opened my eyes to find the city awash in flame and smoke. A body, charred beyond recognition, stared vacantly at me. As I pushed myself away, I realized that everything was muffled, like the world's volume had been turned down. I shakily got to my feet and turned to look at what had knocked me out. It was a crumpled aurora, still smoldering from plasma blasts. I could taste ash in my throat. My eyes burned from the thick clouds of pulverized concrete and smoke as I stumbled down Malkaroy. With each step, the ringing in my ears subsided. I didn't know where I was going. Neither did anyone else. We were scattered, crazed, scared. The skies were filled with vanduul. Local law enforcement and private civilians were battling above the city while others tried to flee. From the shouts of people on their mobies, it wasn't just here. There were attacks all over the planet. Police units swept down the block, collecting survivors and escorting us through the collapsing buildings to a safer location. St. Eric's Hospital was already overflowing. People slumped on the floors, covered in dust and blood. Screams and sobs echoed over the shouts of medics and doctors as they struggled in the smoke to save lives. It was tough to tell who was dead and who wasn't. The walls of the hospital shook with each deafening explosion. With each one, I thought that was it. I was dead. And all I could think of was my Casey and little Natalie, and how they said they'd see me later. I had no medical training, but I couldn't just sit there anywhere. I set out looking for some way to help. I found an abandoned footstall. The thing was mostly empty, except for boxes and boxes of cookies. A few others saw what I was doing and helped me and grabbed what we could. Together we walked around handling them out. Peter Marsters, a local hauler, was nursing a fractured arm. The triage tag said he was a low priority, but you couldn't tell by looking at him. He'd been on the final leg of a shipping run when he entered the system. As he did, he detected the second fleet massing above the planet near the Vega Virgil jump point. Commanded by Admiral Ernst Bishop, who has served along this front for some time, hint, hint. the group of ships included a bingle carrier, several destroyers, and a handful of smaller capital ships. I've been to the border systems a bunch, he said, gently dabbing the cut above his eye with his uninjured hand. So I know when the Navy's running drills. This was no drill. Marsters was passing the fleet and just about to enter Atmo when the Vandal charged. I used to think Bingles ate up and sped out Vandals for snacks, but what I saw coming out of the black, I'd never seen anything like it. UEEM trooper Evie Gora, age 26, was being attended by three medics. She had suffered multiple stab wounds by confronting a Vandal raider in the streets with no weapon. Once they managed to stabilize her, she was able to offer me an opposing point of view. I'm not one to talk up the Navy too much, but that's Bishop's crew, she said, brightening up when I offered her a handful of chocolate cardal cookies. The duel don't stand a chance. 
Three hours later, the explosion subsided. Hospital security watched the doors, unsure whether the silence was important of something good or bad. Finally, a detachment of local police approached with news. The main Vandal fo force had been repelled. Admiral Bishop had won. When morning came, fires were still burning out of control. Comms were down and I still couldn't reach my family. Officially, it all became numbers, estimated death counts, how many personnel were needed for search and rescue, and the true sign of the devastation, how much damage and credits. Anything to avoid putting faces to the horror that we had all endured. Admiral Bishop had come to the planet to survey the destruction personally. The hero of Vega apparently refused to comment. Having heard no word yet on any trains to Astilia, I found myself back at St. Eric's while waiting for the UEE disaster response team announcement outlining their protocol for contacting missing relatives. Inside, I ran into one of the medics who hadn't slept. He informed me that Trooper Gora had taken a sudden turn and passed away from her wounds earlier that morning. They said it could have been worse, that if Admiral Bishop's fleet had not pushed the Vanduul back, the destruction would have been more severe. I don't know if I can believe that. In transmission. War. The majority of Americans do not know <laughs> what it's like to be invaded. Um, air, sea, land, full of enemy. It's, uh, it's one thing to look up to the sky and see vandal planes flying around and you see this destruction and the explosions and the sound, but it's another to, like this individual said, look down the street and see the enemy walking down the street when you end up fighting a multiple front battle or a multiple front war, um, it's not just you versus the enemy. You gotta watch your back, you gotta watch above you, you gotta watch underneath you. This is Mount Warfare for all the veterans listening, right? Um, Sub-level considerations. Like this This is a, a moment that when I read it, and this is the best part about reading lore in this game, when I read it, I put myself in this person's shoes, and that has to be that has to be frightening, especially for your loved ones that you had made a promise to go see or to meet up with. Comms are down. You don't get to text or call. You don't get to make sure that they're okay. Welcome to war on your soil. Americans don't know. <laughs> they don't know that reality, unless you're a veteran and you spent time elsewhere. So just a very powerful, I appreciate you, the narrative team. I appreciate the way you are telling this story. So that was October 6th, 2945, three weeks later. Uh, I think it's a couple days later, Admiral Bishop addresses the Senate. And we're actually gonna watch this. Um, I think it's an amazing job done by the one and only Gary Oldman. Yeah, Squadron 42 is going to have an amazing cast. It's totally worth doing this. So let's get this started. I'll screen share. Enjoy. Skirmishes are incursions. But I am 
be here to tell you that we are at war. Tyber, Orion, Caliban, Virgil, once. Human systems are but abandoned in the face of the enemy. The Vandal, we're at our gates. Weapons bared while we, we hide and cower. Retreating as they burn and decimate everything around us. We cannot let the tragedy of Vega happen again. We cannot give the Vandal any more ground. To defend this empire, we must attack. And we have to be committed to that attack, whatever the cost may be. We have to rebuild our fleet. We have to use the power of human innovation to reclaim these so-called red systems and strike back at the enemy. This will not be an easy fight. It will cost us. New resources, new credits, new lines. Well, some of you may be asking why I undertake such a thing, and I, I can tell you in one word. Victory! For if there's one thing the Vandal has taught us, it's that without victory, there can be no survival! It's hard to <clears throat> it's hard to beat it's hard to beat a professional voice actor uh, <laughs> as much as I uh, love reading and narrating yeah you can't really beat Gary Oldman and doesn't that character like look like Gary Oldman <laughs> amazing uh, amazing let's end this we are two minutes over one last article about three weeks after so by the way <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, that speech was actually October 10th, right? So October 10th, 2945. This is a couple of weeks later, like three weeks later, um, there's an article that comes out called Plain Truth, Bishop's Betrayal. So definitely another take on what we just listened to. I'm going to clear my throat. Okay. There's an old saying that history will be the judge, but I say, why wait? I'm Parker Terrell, and this is the plain truth. It has been about three weeks now since the verse first heard of the attack on Aramis, and I know a lot of you have been waiting to hear my take on things, been wanting to know if I have, or if I'm having the same uneasy feeling and suspicions as you. Well, I think three weeks is long enough to not only allow the government to have their official word, for them to make speeches and promises, but more importantly, it has been time enough for the truth of what transpired that day to begin to come to light as well. Everyone agrees that what had happened in Vega was a tragedy, me included, but I think the real tragedy is more than just the horrible destruction and death of that day. This atrocious attack by the Vanduul finally showed us just how corrupt and morally bankrupt our supposed leaders have become. Before we get into the thick of it, I want to say a few things first. You don't go around exposing the truth as long as I have without realizing that misfortunes like what happened in Vega are different from a politician lying or a corporation betraying its customers and need to be treated as such. Real people died that day in Vega, 
and I'll bet that many of you out there suffered a personal loss or know someone who has. The things I'm going to say, I don't want them to belittle what you all must be feeling. I don't want anyone to think that I'm trying to imply that the horrible events that transpired on the 5th are somehow less meaningful because of the truth behind them. Brave men and women, civilians, citizens, starmen and marines alike, sacrificed more than anyone should be asked to, and all too many good people lost their lives along the way. I want to make it clear that what I'm about to discuss is not on them, no. The accusations I'm going to make lie squarely at the feet of those in power, the ones who allowed their deaths to happen in the first place. Let's look at some facts, shall we? Senator Polo does the Empire a huge favor and, for the first time in decades, if not centuries, makes an extremely admirable attempt to curtail out-of-control military spending. After being stimmied by the Senate, the true power of democracy comes to bear, and the citizens of our grand political experiment will be given the final say in the matter. Now, just as the voting for this groundbreaking initiative is wrapping up, what happens? A vandal kingship decides to pay the poor people of Vega a visit. I find it interesting that when the vandal could have attacked at any time, they somehow managed to choose to launch an all-out assault in the middle of a vote that would slash the military's overly inflated budget, don't you? Especially when you take into account that it's been well over 50 years since the last time a kingship entered a human-controlled system. It seems that we've had no trouble keeping the invading clans at bay since then. So we as responsible, skeptical individuals have to ask, why now? Why Vega? Was Admiral Bishop under orders to let a Vandal fleet through so that the military could show unequivocally that the Empire still needs to funnel them trillions of credits every year? Think about this. We know from first-hand reports that the second fleet was already in place near Vega 2 when the attack happened. Why would the full mass of the fleet be gathered there if they didn't expect an imminent fight? It seems that the Navy had advanced intelligence that a raid was going to happen, or as I believe, had planned for it to happen. Either way, if the Navy did know that Van Duel were on the way, why the hell weren't the people of Aramis warned of the attack earlier? Would the military want to evacuate as many people as possible? Instead, we have survivors saying that the raid sirens only went off at the last possible moment, barely giving them any time to react. Is it possible that maybe, just maybe, the military wanted the body count to be as high as possible? That high command believed the only way to ensure their budget for the next hundred years was to have enough blood spilled that every human would be rushing to give them anything they asked. It was either negligence or malfeasance that led to so many deaths on Aramis. And to be honest, I'm not sure which scares me more. Actually, I take that back. I know what scares me the most, and it's this. It is looking more and more like they are going to get exactly what they want. Thanks to the death of those few million innocent people in Admiral Ernst Bishop's recent fervent plea to the Senate, I am sure that any day now we'll be having We'll be hearing that our conflict with the Vandal has been escalated to a full declaration of war. Then it won't matter if the Polo Initiative passes or not. The military will have unfettered access to a wartime budget completely separate from the normal fiduciary constraints and not part of the spending cuts outlined by the initiative. I can only imagine the next gigantic boondoggle that the Navy will leap to throw money at in the name of defending the Empire. Let's take a break here. I need a minute to calm down, and I want all of you to have the chance to reflect. The truth can sometimes be a hard pill to swallow, but it's a bitter medicine we all need to take. When we come back, Gerald Ferv, a survivor of the fall of the Caliban, will join us to give his take on what happened in Vega. This is the plain truth and nothing else in transmission and that is it for our lore deep dive of episode 14 <laughs> declaration of war 
Uh, and as we set the stage for Squadron 42, it is very clear that there is substance. There's over, what, 900 years, 950 years of substance, right? There is political intrigue, military discourse. There's social implications, economic implications. There's terraforming and going against what we think as humans is the best course of action. We're creating synth world to live on planets that are completely man-made. Like there is so many directions that this game can go. And I'm, I'm talking about Squadron 42. I'm not talking about Star Citizen with the infinite sandscape <laughs> or sandbox that we get to just jump in and play. I'm talking about Squadron 42, the game that'll follow Starfield. There is a lot to get excited about. And me as a, as a lore fanatic, uh, I'm, I'm living my best life. <laughs> this is this has been a lot of fun and i hope you have also found value again this is part one we just set the stage there's a lot to uncover a lot of people to get into um it's going to be fun to profile the next several um people places events and you can find all of it here in beyond the verse so thank you so much. I hope this finds everybody well. Until next Thursday, safe travels in the verse, y'all. You've been listening to Beyond the Verse, Star Citizen podcast with your host, Solus. Join our in-game organization, Soul Provision, by applying at www.robertspaceindustries.com forward slash orgs forward slash provision. You can get involved in the conversation with your questions, comments, or emotional outbursts by emailing us at starcitizenbtv at gmail.com. Watch us live on Thursdays, 8 p.m. Central, at youtube.com forward slash at starcitizenbtv. And follow the conversation over at Twitter and Instagram, both at forward slash starcitizenbtv. Once again, thank you for joining us. We hope this finds you well. Until next time, safe travels as you traverse beyond the verse.